Good morning. I still don't know how to look in this camera phone properly. My name is Dr. John Taylor Kent. I'm a retired psychologist. Uh, I specialized prematurely. Uh, I began a specialization in neuropsychology, then went to industrial organizational psychology, and then to family systems. Ultimately, I learned that being a generalist was the best thing for me. It was wonderful. I never knew what was coming through the door. It was always something different. The variety was just incredibly engaging and I loved it quite a bit. At the last of my practice, I ended up being able to only secure a position with the Department of Corrections. Now, it was not my first choice by a long shot. However, it was the best choice. Why? because these men put in health needs requests and they had to spend, I think it was $3 out of their own bank to be able to come and see the psychologist to get some therapy. And so when these men put in $3 that was hard to come by, you know, very hard to come by when you're behind the, in the big house, behind the walls, you can't just get money. I knew that it was pretty serious and I also wanted to make sure to give them their full value. Now. I wasn't getting the $3, it was going to the state, but I was gonna do the job properly. And some of these inmates had serious problems. And occasionally they would come in seeking help for themselves or somebody else, or there was a serious problem, uh, even a serious security problem, an officer in danger. I paid attention and I did my job properly. And what I ended up having to do was practicing very quickly on my feet. I had to ascertain exactly what was going on, what the inmate needed to hear right on the spot, and I had to be able to give them a proper read down and the advice right then and there because I was working with maximum security and hold on, I'll shut that off right now. Thank you for bearing with me in the interruption. In other words, I didn't have hardly any chance to spend time to work this up, to give it time. And the inmates really couldn't spend much time with me because I was in usually the, usually the central office, the central, well, the central control of the unit. And if they went in there, the other inmates thought they were snitching. And so they didn't want to hang out in there for long. So I had to take care of business very quickly. And as it was maximum security, these inmates were moved in and moved out. And I usually got to see them once, maybe twice. And that was about it. Very rare did I get to do what I would consider any type of long-term therapy. Long-term therapy being uh, close to a year or you know several months anyway, a dozen sessions. Never did it. Never had a dozen sessions with an inmate in the big house. Uh, typically took care of it in one session uh, and quite often the inmate would come back and I would look at them and I was like, wow, man, whatever you did, keep doing it. And I would put the locus of control on the inmate. In other words, it wasn't me who did it. I got to watch the inmate do it. I was just the witness of this. So, if you would like my services, I'd be glad to give those to you. I, some compensation would be wonderful. But if, on the other hand, you're out there and you would like to just support my, my ministry, my mission, me helping other people, feel free to gift me. I'm going to be putting up my, well, if I can remember or find it, uh, my PayPal account so that you can gift me. Uh, whatever you want, uh, well, I appreciate the help. I can definitely use the help. As you can see, my overhead is actually, well, it's as low as I can make it and stay off the streets. I'm on the road, not on the streets. It's, it's definitely a blessing. Believe me, it's much better than being on the streets. So I act quickly. And, and what I had to do was I had to realize that I didn't really have the answers, hardly at all. And I don't like that light. I'll try to get rid of some of it, but it's behind me, I think. 
So I would sit there and I would pray to Yahweh Creator Father. And my prayer was very simple. You know, at the time I didn't know his name was Yahweh, by the way. I would say, God, you know a man better than anyone else can know a man. This, inmate, this, this man's coming to see me and he needs a message. So would you do me the favor and help me to give him the message that you want him to hear? So I was just the messenger. And I didn't share that, that prayer very much because, you know, I'm flying by the seat of my pants. I don't even have a full hour intake that I can do with this fellow, you know. I'm going to have to hear him out and I'm going to have to take a few notes so I'll remember him and be able to cue myself up if he comes back in and remember what his issues were and remember what I did. And typically... I would listen for about, oh, 15 minutes. Uh, and I'd listen and listen and listen, and I would get the, some impressions, and usually I would begin by saying, look, my impressions are, I'm not sure, but these are my impressions, and if if you can tell me better, you know, if you can correct me, if, I'm, if I don't have something right, if you can tell me, that's a sign of good mental health. So... Don't be afraid to, you know, to correct me if I'm wrong here, but these are my impressions. And I would read it down very quickly. And I would usually give them some directions and some things that they can do, some places they can take this. And some of these inmates never had honest feedback in their lives. And, I mean, they took it to heart, and they would come back changed. And I'm going, wait a minute says in the books you can't change I'd look at the inmate I'd look down at the record I'd look up at this man in front of me again and, and I would tell him look you've done this you've changed so I put the locus of control in them it's not Dr. Kent doing it I just get to witness it and I had an uncanny gift I don't regard it as much of a gift today because I realize it was it, it was a flaw I had a flaw in me and that was, I had this uncanny ability to merge with another human being. I mean, to actually get in there and feel what was going on and sense stuff. And it was scary because I couldn't keep myself separate sometimes. And so I had this, I had poor boundaries, really, is what it come down to. I had this, uh, this ability to go in and sort things out. And sometimes I could fix them on the spot. I still could do that. As a matter of fact, uh, if I had to see an inmate for the fifth time or sixth time, I figured, hey, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not doing something right here. Because typically, two, maybe three times were all that was required. Uh, the inmate was free to go. They were, whatever it was, they were freed of, and they, they were off on their own, independent of me, which is what I want for my clients. I don't want you dependent upon me. I don't want you having to come back. I don't want you spending your money unnecessarily or your time or, or suffering unnecessarily. I don't need to make you dependent upon me to make me feel good about myself. I'm happy the way I am. You know, I was created very flawed. I went through a, a really rough family upbringing. It was horrible for me. And um, I had some... I made some poor choices, too. That didn't help things at all, by the way. But I also got to work through these things. And it was an amazing labyrinth that I had to deal with. And I, I went through the education system, and it was difficult. And I had enough difficulties that, that I shared those with my supervisors, and they kept me longer. And they supervised me more. I ended up with more supervisory training than almost any psychologist practicing today. I ended up with years of supervision, probably four, oh, almost, well, it was close to five years. It was more than four years of supervision, almost five, four and a half years. Um, and the advantages were I had three wonderful gentlemen helping me. Um, they were all men of the cloth, by the way. They're all men of faith. The last one was studying to become a rabbi, and his wife finally told me that little family gem that little family secret. But there goes my backlighting. I'll see if I can get it back up again. So, what I want to get across to you is my services are available. I have to use the phone, though. 
I don't use cameras for these services. I don't keep records. I'm available for what I call a consultation because I don't want to do long-term therapy. I'm an old man now. Um, I say, I'd love to go to work, but don't you take my naps away from me? Well, yes, I'm, I'm an old man. So there's no doubt about it. I look in the mirror and I don't say Papa, Dad, I say Grandpa. And actually at this point, I'm looking older than my grandfather's looked. Uh, and I take good care of myself. I think you, maybe you, maybe it shows, maybe you can see that. And I exercise, work with a couple of trainers uh, when I can. I have to do everything judiciously. I would love to, uh, I'd love to have some income. I'd love to do some work. I'd love to give you more than you give me. That's for sure. Um, and I, I think I can help you. I don't view things like the psychologists do today. They do a negative projective practice. On the other hand, sure, I might describe something. At least when I was practicing as a psychologist, I would go through all the steps, all the criteria, come up with a diagnosis and a code, you know, the, the title, the label, and the code number associated with that. So I could justify and defend my practice primarily. But the moment I was done with that stuff, I was done with it. At that point, I'm looking at where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, how we can get you balanced up. Where are the, where are the problems at? Uh, what's the quickest road to this? I mean, do we want to work on personality aspects um, and really do long-term knockdown drag out? I don't want to. Or do we want to work on what I consider the crown of it all, character? We'll work on your character. That'll correct personality stuff and everything else. And by the way, it's personality that feeds in the Axis One diagnoses, the thought disorders and the, uh, the mood disorders. Uh, they're basically fed by the others. So we look at those stressors. We look at where some, some weak spots are. We shore you up. We get you cast in good, good shoes, not in cement overshoes and throw you overboard. That's the way most professionals regard you. You're just a throwaway person, and they want to refer you as fast as they can for medications. Now, I don't treat people who are on medications that I know depress them or going to lead them to becoming suicidal. I don't treat people long-term. I don't treat borderline personality disorders. People that think they have to bleed all over me because that's what their families let them do or other people do. No, no, I, I don't put up with that. You go somewhere else for that stuff. You pay, you pay somebody in regular practice uh, the big bucks for that and they're gonna open up a chart for it and they're gonna have people behind them that they go see to discharge to be able to handle your mess or to staff with when they say, hey, I'm not, I'm not getting anywhere with this client. What can I do? You know, I still got those contacts. I still have those people. But I think I'm probably best for those who want to know if they're getting the right treatment right now, if they're getting good services, if they're on the best road, if there's a particular therapy they should avail themselves of that will get them better results. Um, that's what I'm good for. And in case you're wondering, most mental illness, the, most people have something physically wrong with them. The problem is you go to medical doctors who are trained to uh, treat symptoms and not go to the root causes, and they almost never go after the toxins, the heavy metals and the poisons that are built up into us from this environment with these manufactured foods, which they literally spike with a little bit of poison just so they can over time poison you slowly and get away with it. Now, you might think that that sounds mentally ill and diluted, but it's not. The primary metal they've been using has been, um, oh my God, manganese. Manganese uh, accumulates in the brain, in the basal glia, in the middle of the brain, and it causes misfires. It causes changes in timing. And if you get that during your developmental years, it can screw you up for life. Uh, most of us have got a lot of aluminum, lead, some arsenic, some, a lot of mercury, cadmium. Th these things need to be taken care of. You need to address those. Now, when I was practicing, they required a psychologist to send you to a medical doctor to screen you first for medical causes. Well, the real problem is 
Those guys don't even understand the medical causes of most mental illnesses. They aren't schooled in it. They're taught to turn a blind eye to it because to you, we are just throwaway people. That's what they are to, the, to those practitioners. So if you need my help, or if you'd like to support me in helping others, do me a favor, send me a gift. I'd appreciate that. If you want my help, email me. Get, we'll get on the phone. I have to hear your voice. You got to let me get my hearing aids charged up. I don't have them in right now because I've got to be able to hear the, the, those inflections in your voice so I can pick things up. I'm sure we probably could use uh, video cameras if I've got good signal. Um, I, I don't have regular Wi-Fi service. Uh, and hopefully, maybe um, somebody out there, bless me, uh, I'll get blessed enough so that I can afford a little bit nicer rig and maybe get a, a satellite communication set up so that I've got good bandwidth and can do that. That would be nice. It's not necessary. I remind you, I'm available for consultation. You can give that to somebody else if you like. You can pass it on. So just wanted to let you know a little bit about myself if you really want to know more about me, you can go to go to the Dr. Ketch show. It's on the internet, which reminds me I've got to renew my domain here within the next three days. We're giving psychology away. And you can read about my development as a psychologist. Um, the essays are kind of buried there. You can read about my philosophy and some of the things I've been through as well. So it's a... It's, uh, I do think you should shop carefully for who you're going to be allowing into your head in your mental health because most of these people are, are, are libtards. They're liberals and their value system is such that if you're a conservative, they will screw you up. And they can't help it. Um, if you go to a conservative as a, as a liberal, uh, it's actually safer and much better for you because we have the values. We have the value systems that you need. And, and we want you to be independent. We don't want you to be dependent. And we don't want to lie to you or cajole you or kid you about anything. We really want to see our clients taken off. And back when I was getting trained up, 15% of psychologists were conservatives. And we're talking about three or four, three decades ago, okay? Today, it's probably less than 5%. The boards weed us out. If they discover that we are conservative and vote the wrong way, don't vote, vote the proper party line. They, they run us out as fast as they can. Um, a lot of these boards have been set up so that they do face-to-face -face interviews, testing, so that they can detect if you're a conservative. Because if you are, they don't want you there. If you have a value system, if you have faith at all, oh, they certainly don't want you there because we can't have that. We can't have people proselytizing. Uh, I have sat for boards, exams, and some states eliminated exams. And uh, it, it is about the same everywhere. They're, the psychologists on these boards are, are drunk with power. They're pretty crazy. And they want to lord it over others. They're given this little fiefdom, this little domain, and they're going to run havoc over people. So it's hard to get good treatment out there. And if you're a treatment provider like I was, it's harder to get good treatment. So I've had plenty of it. I've had my fill of it. Well, don't get me wrong. If I had the word with all the money and found somebody that was good, I would probably do it again. Uh, I'd probably work with an older woman next time. Uh, but the qualifications would be that she would uh, have to be well married. You know, children, successful marriage, still married. I would not go to a feminist. No way. They're so destructive. They've done so much destruction in our society. There's no way I'm going to go submit to one of them. And the other thing is, if you're going for therapy, ask for a copy of the notes, the handwritten notes, as well as the printed up notes. Why? Because we tend to write bad things in there. And if anybody gets a hold of your records, and there's no confidentiality. It all gets gets sent electronically to the central government today. So you've got that problem. And we give you diagnoses and we say, 
this is for life and you can't get better. But over the years of practicing, I saw so many people do much better. Really much better. And I was happy when I'd run into them in the public and see them enjoying their lives. And, and maybe I get a little acknowledgement on the side because it's not my place to say hello to a former client and acknowledge them. That would be a violation of confidentiality. But um, I could see some success many, many times. And in this field, we don't get to see our successes very often. So it's really wonderful when somebody that we've helped gets back with us and lets us know how well they're doing or how they did. I'll never forget one fellow who uh, was having some problems because the doctor was insisting he take some medicines. And it was the medicines causing the problems. I see this guy and he's doing real well. And I couldn't, I mean, we were alone together in the post office, you know, checking mail there in a little town I was working at in Mississippi. And he started it up, I'm pretty sure, but I'll tell you, I, I asked him how he was doing and he told me that um, he fired the doctor. He says, you're right. You gotta be careful of these medicines. They, uh, they, they cause more trouble than they help, in my honest opinion. It is treatment. If you have to have it, you have to have it. But stay on the minimal effective dose. Don't allow them to rack it up on you. And don't stay on it for a long period of time. You shouldn't need it for more than a year. But whatever it is, you should be able to work it out. So my general guideline is six months to a year. That's the old practicing recommendations, by the way. Today, they'll tell you, you stay on it for life. And I'll tell you this. All those beautiful color pictures that they take of the brain lit up this way and that way, that's not the disease. They tell you it's the disease. It's actually the evidence of the damage their medicines are doing to you. So they cause permanent chemical imbalances. And some of these medicines negate your ability to love another. Look at the medicines that the school shooters were on. They were almost all in the same medication class, at least, if not the same medicines. Look at the mass shooters, how many of them were on the best medications available. Yeah, the modern psychiatric medications with their philosophies, you never stop this stuff. You need it for life. Hogwash. May Yahweh bless you. He has blessed me.